I V M. Hey guys, this is Chuck here. And before we dive into all the banter and bad jokes on this week's episode, I want to let you know about a new show I'm hosting. It's called One Rep at a Time. It's got me talking about the various aspects of fitness and health, like nutrition, exercise, stress, sleep. It's a show geared towards those who are looking to kickstart their fitness journey. I drop in lots of trivia, give you my own experiences and mistakes, lots of tips, speak to a lot of experts. So if you're looking to start a fitness journey, this is the show for you. Check out One Rep at a Time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and other podcast apps. All right, on with the show. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Simplified, the podcast that promises to make you only look smarter without altering your natural state of ignorance and lives up to that promise. So yeah, we don't try too hard. To <laughs> yeah, <be honest. laughs> this this is the podcast that actually wants to make you laugh, yeah. but we are so self conscious that we want to couch it in in the veil of saying we want to try to make you sound smarter. Actually, yeah. that's not the intent at all. Just to see how far we can push in the rain. I think today you're going to tell us uh, how grass grows. Is yeah, that, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Before we dive into the episode, though, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. this podcast usually has four hosts: uh, Chuck and Sri Keith, who are not here, but here today for you. Uh, I'm Tony, and uh, I'm Naren, and I'm uh, sort of uh, all raring to go with a very, very technical, very profound <laughs> not episode <laughs> on fertilizer okay. subsidies. We, we've okay. we've mm. done basically. An episode on ice cream, I think, yeah. <laughs> which is apparently going viral for some yeah. reason. Uh, post which we had stories uh, from you about Mumbai, which is totally unscripted, uh, but also worked out well. But now we're talking about fertilizer subsidies yeah. and actually how grass grows. To this discussion, only brought manure or bullshit, which also <laughs> apparently helps grass grow. It's all yes, the right. Go for yeah. it. So yeah. How I got the idea for this yeah. episode was I recently uh, went to a place in sort of eastern, southeastern Maharashtra called Latur, oh, yeah. which is uh, infamous actually for a very, very uh, severe earthquake that uh, happened some decades ago. Mm-hmm. And it's also for some reason like a center for turning out toppers in the state board. <laughs> so literally every year, Wow. The toppers come from here. It's an educational center. It has, you know, I don't know, hundreds of uh, coaching institutions and all of them are doing. It's called the Latur pattern of education. It's almost, uh, you know, is almost as uh, well known as the quota. Oh, it has a GI, geographical indicator. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does. Yeah. It is a state board topper only if it comes from the Latur region yeah. of Maharashtra. Otherwise, it is just called a nerd. <laughs> I'm <guessing. laughs> So, yeah, very charming place. The reason, uh, uh, you know, we had gone was we were meeting up with some friends and they are from the agricultural sector. So, right. just, you know, just going around and they were, one of them was telling me about the, you know, the agricultural situation in India mm-hmm. and especially the fertilizer subsidy part of it. Right which always was large to begin with, yeah. like my midriff, and yeah. <laughs> is, has gotten only larger like my yeah. midriff. I mean, Narayan, yeah. I think we should acknowledge at this point that uh, inflation is off the charts. Yeah. And that applies to all of our midriffs as well. So, Yeah, I, I was actually, uh, to tell the audience, I'm meeting Tony in person after a long time, <laughs> and I was very happy to note, or very gratified to note that he has a nice little <laughs> midriff as well. So, yeah, I'm not the only guy with a pot belly here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we're all about the riffing. Top riffing, <laughs> bottom riffing, mid riffing, whatever. Yeah, riff. yeah so, so, so the hmm. southeastern part of Maharashtra is definitely not on the coast. And I'm guessing it doesn't yeah. get a lot of rain either. Yeah, it doesn't get a lot of rain. It's a very, very flat part of, uh, you yeah. know, is a Deccan plateau basically. Yeah. And it was a big. It I mean, started. It, was, it started off near the sea, but then it plateaued. Could also be yeah. a tagline yeah. for simplified. But anyway, yeah. So it's it's agricultural. It's, yeah. It's a very nice. This is you know someone from Bombay. You you, you know everywhere you look, you see high rise buildings. Right. Latur. You know you just 
I mean, it's just flat. One, yeah, it's just ground and one story. That's it. Like everywhere yeah. you look. Yeah. It's very nice, refreshing, and uh, very hot as well, mm. but uh, charming place. Great. And yeah, I mean, that's all. And there is also one terrible joke I made about Latur, which was <laughs> I told my host that uh, see you Latur Ali Gatur. <laughs> oh he was like, seriously? <laughs> so he didn't even laugh at it. So yeah, such as it is, that was my Latur joke. Very nice. And um, Wait, what's hmm. the like primary crop in Latur? I think it is soya bean. Okay. And tur dal for some reason. It's two seasons or one? I think it's uh, like soya bean is three months. Yeah. Uh, tur dal is another four months. Right. And there is another crop, I think groundnuts, I'm not sure. No. Yeah. And it's like a big center for, you know, for rural Maharashtra yeah. of that region. Yeah. It's literally the pulse of the... Yeah, it's literally the of, pulse of, yeah. Of the nation, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't think there are any serial killers yet <laughs> out of Latur. Right. Yeah. You know, thank God. But yeah. And it's, I was, you know, I learned a lot about, uh, I knew zero about agriculture. So every little thing that I learned was a lot. Yeah. And uh, he basically told me that this year, the agriculture sector will probably do very, very well. Because soybean prices have almost doubled. Cotton oh. prices have like tripled. Right. Turdal prices have gone up a lot. Sugar uh, is doing very well. So, a, a good part of Latur also grows sugar cane. I don't know how right. because there isn't much rain there. I guess it's irrigation, tube bells, whatever it is. Yeah. And uh, so, sugar cane is the usual, uh, is the ideal cyclical industry, right? So, if, if sugar cane crop is very good, yeah. sugar cane prices drop. Yeah. And uh, mills make a lot of money because their input costs go down. Oh. But the farmers suffer because, you know, they get very poor prices. For yeah. the next season, they don't grow sugarcane. Right. So, there is a lot less sugarcane on the market. So, sugarcane prices go up. Right. Which means that uh, the sugar mills, you know, they make a lot less profit. Yeah. And uh, then in the next uh, cycle, all the other sugarcane farmers have seen that, yeah. you know, the prices have gone up, they grow yeah. sugarcane again. So, it's one of those but cyclical industries. Can you game this or like, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure if with the data analytics and machine learning yeah. and uh, yeah. those kind of things. Yeah. But yeah, Latu's yeah, lots of Lots of uh, crypto yeah. investors who have listened to us in the past <laughs> and now looking for like safer options to game. So like sugarcane in Latur. Yes. Go, go for it. Put go for it. <laughs> yeah. So he was also telling me that, uh, you know, we are actually, there is a huge crisis looming on the fertilizer sector because there is there are basically three big fertilizers that are required. One is urea, mm -hmm. which India makes a lot of. Right. It's subsidized. Yeah. It is enormously subsidized. And the reason for... Uh, so, I have to go a little into the background. Yeah. Are you going to go to the your famous nitrogen cycle? Yes. <laughs> oh, there we go. Ever, yeah. there so we go. He's the guy to blame. Yeah. He figured out nitrogenous yeah, fertilizers right. and it was great for the thing um, for crops and you know it really solved the productivity problem and started. the problem was that India didn't get those uh, fertilizers till a lot later green revolution. and in yeah the green revolution so in 1965 apparently we had a really bad drought yeah so that way I mean all of India is perennially in a drought but that year it was like really really bad a lot of people died yeah and uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri was the prime minister then and he decided that something had to be done. Mm -hmm. And he started, kick started this. There was a guy named Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug, yeah. yeah. So he, uh, you know, they, they I, I don't think he did it, but yeah. people like, you know, sort of transplanted his model here. Yeah, But I so, think there was like a special variety of wheat or something. Yeah, like so they, they did a high yielding variety wheat. Yeah. They improved the irrigation. Yeah. And uh, they introduced fertilizer. And uh, it was expensive, right? So, yeah. The government said that we needed to and so I okay hmm. very like tangential aside much like you know on brand for simplified but where I ended up learning swimming was at my mother's house like in the very interior interiors of Kerala I would say like not even close to a town for that matter but like it was in a irrigation canal mm. which was part of some a proper general, long linear yeah 
equal depth right which will be safe right, right. right. Yeah. but i'm yeah. guessing that's part of like some large irrigation project it was obviously hmm. named jawaharlal nehru canal or something like everything, like everything <laughs> else so i'm guessing it is probably around the same time that irrigation picked off in a big way so yeah so i actually uh, as i uh, what little i know of this was the green revolution started in three states yeah punjab tamil nadu and andhra pradesh right and for some reason it did very well in punjab and not so well in tamil nadu and andhra pradesh oh, okay i think that's because uh, tamil nadu and andhra pradesh didn't have that much irrigation right these guys uh, the punjab already had a system of irrigation right. it had it had rivers and it had a network and everything like that right but i should tell you that uh, there's one variety of rice which is called ir8 mm. it's a high yielding semi dwarf uh, dwarf rice variety mm. developed by the international rice research institute in the early 1960s obviously i'm reading this of wikipedia it was uh, the work by Peter Jennings and Henry Beckel but whatever the only reason i know this ir8 is because if you've seen the movie onion i don't know what is called in aparijit in hindi aparijit do mm. whatever it's basically like vikram having like split personalities or whatever mm. and like he's trying to woo this girl okay so he is trying to describe her features in the best way possible so he basically like tries to describe her eyes like a fish which is pretty common right but mm. there is a description of her teeth which says ir8 pallikari which is like ir uh, a girl with teeth like ir8 so the wow. spe- <laughs> the specialty of ir8 was i think it was small and it was also very white pearly oh. white so oh. yeah, yeah yeah i'm not sure how much it took off in tamil nadu but i, I think like it was still pretty popular it, it, that's such an awesome reference <laughs> <laughs> connect uh, ir8 with fertilizer subsidy yeah, <laughs> yeah. so because they took off they started uh, you know consuming more fertilizers yeah and uh, you know initially government said that okay you can't blame the government either because they have also to keep an eye on food prices right. so if the food prices go too high yeah. a lot of people will starve because they won't be able to buy food yeah. and things like that yeah. so they decided that the smartest way to go about it was subsidizing the fertilizer yeah and this thing can has, i hmm. make another digression i'm really sorry mm-hmm. about, but i remember like at some point in time actually you can make all the digressions yeah, sure. right because what i know like of fertilizer channel. subsidies <laughs> can be written on the back of the <laughs> bus ticket <laughs> and okay. still space left over for what i know about agriculture yeah yeah so this one was uh, two things one is that uh, we thought for the at least as you know malayali is growing up very like uh, haughty culture but mm. like not haughty culture like just haughty about our own like upbringing and like what is native to us and like i used to be for the longest time how can you make sabudana from tapioca till i realized tapioca actually came from cassava from elsewhere right? it's yeah. not like a native uh, grown it's by thing. no means yeah, native by, yeah by no means and you're staggered when somebody right. tells you how recent it is right? exactly yeah. some way world war 2 type yeah, yeah again like yeah. at the risk of go- going hungry you like yeah. transplant some crop which is easy to grow and like tapioca is now a universally acknowledged malu dish right like kappa if you want to have kappa biryani or like kappa and mean curry please go for it mm. if it doesn't taste good it's because you're in bombay but anywhere else in the world it'll taste beautiful but the question was like I remember my parents and my uncles and aunts all like being nostalgic in like not necessarily a happy way about the time when they were air dropping macaroni mm. like macaroni used to be what they call it like I'm guessing like this is another time of food shortage and 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 times like I that I think like, world war was that uh, maybe but maybe, yeah. like macaroni never picked up but tapioca did so yeah. like yeah I mean they've been we were a very very poor and hungry country yeah yeah we yeah, actually my my grandfather told me my grandfather uh, uh, started a small restaurant in bombay yeah and it it did very well and that entire generation my father's generation they you know they got a good education and everyone did very well in life because of the education right. you know india was growing at that time and everything yeah. turned out well yeah. all because of this little restaurant that he started oh wow So why did he start the restaurant? Because when he was back home in his uh, village near Mangalore, yeah. there wasn't enough to eat. Okay, there were five or six siblings, <laughs> nothing to eat, and he was growing. He was thirteen or fourteen years old, tired of uh, going hungry. 
So he ran away from house. He went off to Cochin or some place because right. someone promised him a job. Yeah. And he didn't get that job. Then somebody else told him that, hey, what are you doing here? This is not a place. Go to Bombay. So he went to Bombay. Oh, wow. Then he lived at some relative's place. And then he started a small restaurant. Some, uh, yeah. you know, somehow he managed to make ends meet. And then yeah. it, it started doing well. So he was uh, telling me at that time that uh, starvation and death by starvation was very common. Yeah. Right. So when people starve, for some time they feel hungry. Yeah. That's what he told me. Yeah. And he said after that time they stop feeling hungry. Oh wow. Okay. And then they just die. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. And that I don't know if this is true, but it was so. Yeah. Scary. No, it's mm. possibly true. I mean, of course it's true, but mm. just like it took a dark turn because yeah. I was going to connect it to like people who do intermittent fasting and keto and all because like the first month is always the hardest. Right? Yeah. So and then after that you stop feeling hungry and. No, the, I can't, that's a natural response. <laughs> yeah. Only that we, uh, you know, yeah. we do it out of choice. Yeah. And you know that you have to take your nutrition, yeah. and even though you're not hungry, right. you make sure you have. But what was like... You don't realize when was, you're wasting yeah, away. Yeah. After some time, you're just like, you know, you're... Completely wasting thing, away. Yeah. Yeah. So that green revolution was very opportune and this fertilizer subsidy probably helped in, in doing that. Yeah. But the problem is like all government, uh, you know, interventions and, you know, they started off with the noblest of intentions, but then it ballooned into this huge unmanageable monstrosity. Yeah, and really no one knows what to do anything about it. So now to give you an idea of the ironies of things, urea, okay, yeah. is approximately one fourth of uh, the cost. Like in India, it sold at about one fourth the price it sold in Bangladesh. Oh wow! Because of the subsidies. Because of the subsidies, okay. right? And what people do, yeah. you know, especially in the border, I, I'm sure it's not. Very yeah. uh, rampant because yeah. then, but but basically they smuggle right. <laughs> urea into Bangladesh and make money. Yeah, yeah. those kind of things happen. Yeah. Good Actually, thing it, speaking it of urea, it. yeah, I have to. I have a niece named Ria <laughs> who recently got married, and I think she lost a great opportunity of whenever her husband at some point of time would have said, "I love you, Ria." She should have bought a two hundred and forty-five rupees bag of forty-five kgs of urea and given it. To her. She missed that. <laughs> Oh my God. And yeah, that's, that's so sad. Yeah. So, Ria, but you can still do that because I'm sure your husband will is going to say, I love you, Ria, sometime. I, I, yeah. I love how you assume all of our families are listening to Simplified <laughs> and we're still like not being thrown out of our houses. That's great optimism. Okay, I want to take a deviation and ask you about the science of things. Right? Like mm. nitrogen is like 70 plus percent, 78 78%. 78% in the atmosphere. Why is it so hard to Yeah, for fix? some reason, nitrogen is uh, absolutely, you know, it's, it's like one of those uh, dune school uh, yeah, it's like a so, or something. So they don't want to mix with anyone. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, so bo. Yeah. And uh, uh, it takes a lot of uh, energy yeah. to convert it into ammonia. Okay. Uh, which is nitrogen and hydrogen. And was this Fritz is, Haber or something else? So that, it used to happen in nature by lightning. So yeah. whenever lightning happened, oh. you would, uh, you know, you would have and that much ammonia was enough for the plant. But famously, lightning ever strikes at the same place. Twice, <laughs> same so like, place what will you do right. next season? So Fritz Haber was at that time. So yeah. uh, how this started was they were trying to make potassium nitrate. Yeah. So potassium nitrate was a an explosive, right. right? And the Germans want, it was mined. So yeah. potassium nitrate occurred in nature in rocks. Yeah. And there were like three or four key mines. Yeah. And all of them were under the control of the British. Oh. And when, you know, when there was uh, belligerence happening, they sort of locked up those places. Yeah. These guys couldn't get enough uh, potassium nitrate. Wow. So this guy said, we have to make our own. And he figured out how to synthesize Nitrogen. You need a catalyst. You need a lot of energy. You need nitrogen. Right. And you need. But you're hydrogen. basically plucking it out of the air, or plucking is there some out of the okay. air? Yeah. And then you synthesize ammonia, and then it becomes ammonium, whatever it is. It becomes right. urea. It becomes different forms. But now the nitrogen is what they call fixed. Okay. So once the nitrogen is fixed, you can keep changing. And the fixed nitrogen is food for the plant. Okay. What is fixed nitrogen? In it this was, elemental form? It, it's yeah, no, not elemental form. It's uh, In the elemental form, it's there all around. We're right. breathing it in. When it's combined with the hydrogen. 
then it's like you know this available to the plants okay. that's that's how it happens and not explosive and okay, explosives also so they wanted to make it in fact that is one of the you know you you can take nitrates and yeah. make uh, yeah even i think uh, uh, all these fireworks are made of that yeah. tnt tri nitrotoluene yeah. so whatever the military uses is far more lethal and i don't think they are nitrates and all but back in the day that was what they would use for cannon balls and things like that yeah mm. but we are i mean at least my generation i want to say our generation is is more used to nitrogen in like heston blumenthal's ice cream yeah. with liquid nitrogen as opposed to like yeah. you know using it for fertilizers etc but like it is such a big deal to play in the whole uh, you know production of food right Yeah, yeah, and then it was accidentally discovered. It was uh, they wanted to make it an explosive, and then they found out that it is terrific for crop, like incredibly. So your crop yields went up ten x. Wow! And it was officially the end of world hunger, right. except that you know politics being what it is, yeah. you didn't want it getting to other people and things right. like that. So for several decades, uh, it didn't go out into the entire world. That's why. less developed countries like us yeah. and bangladesh and ethiopia somalia all these places there was a lot of starvation in india it stopped i think around uh, 70s after that i don't think we had any famines of that level mm. but i think in africa they had it well into the 90s yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. even now i mean we are in the middle of a new cycle where there has been like talk about wheat export and u turn yeah. and all of that so I that's mean, also very fascinating So apparently, when uh, when fertilizer was discovered, US was one of the countries with huge amounts of uh, arable land, yeah, and all the technology. They started growing wheat like anything, yeah, and corn. And what they did was instead of giving other countries the technology, they decided to give other countries the grain, okay, so as to keep, keep the... them, uh, you know. sort of satellite nations or sort of subservient to yeah to united states but even that backfired because when india had a huge famine yeah. in 1965 they gave us some wheat yeah apparently which was so bad that you know even the horses wouldn't eat it or something wow. some yeah. some such story yeah and uh, that was when the indian like you know establishment in a rare moment of sincerity decided to actually do something about it and they did it they they actually ushered in the green revolution but it went crazy after some time because urea is so cheap yeah. so you need urea you need phosphates okay there's something what, known as diammonium sorry phosphate. what was the green revolution so green revolution is productivity improved almost yeah. tenfold by fivefold basically tenfold. discovering fertilizer so at the three things scale. irrigation yeah. seeds and fertilizer right so all three things at the same time in a planned manner offered to farmers at subsidy what happened was you also needed apart from this yeah farm equipment because yeah. if you want to make money you need a large farm you need yeah. tractors or manual labor cheap manual or cheap manual labor yeah. but cheap manual labor people had you also needed mechanized farming oh, okay. you also needed pesticide right. so those were not subsidized they were expensive right so some farmers like in punjab already had rich farm Right. because it was a farming land so there were farmers what and know, they had great natural irrigation yeah well. so they they did very well and they 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 went in for mechanized the rest of the country took a long while to catch up right so that's why uh, like states like bihar and uh, orissa yeah are really backward even today okay because they just didn't have those resources at that time right and they couldn't develop and you know population increases farm sizes decrease Yeah, we used to have a professor who used to say, you know, the problem of India is that people of India are more fertile than the soil of India. <laughs> But that was actually very sad. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, yeah, it was like you know people were just weren't able to make ends meet, and yeah. uh, you know, so they everyone stayed on the farm. They yeah. I think the line anymore. line my prof used to use was uh, procreation is the recreation of the poor. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very you know, disparaging. Yeah, 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 disparaging yeah, and yeah, insensitive kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. just because you are born in a particular place and time you can make whatever yeah. but anyway like it's like a not, in fact there are very thing. interesting experiments someone uh, i read about you a very small uh, change in the initial conditions right can have a very uh, sort of dramatic change in the outcome so right. what they do is there's an experiment a simulation yeah. experiment yeah. there is a you know urn containing balls of different colors right 
and you every time you pick out a ball yeah you replace it with two balls of that color something like that the same right? color yeah so let's say you have red green and blue right so if i pick out a red ball yeah i put in two red balls yeah so now slowly what happens is the probability that i'm going to the next ball is going to get picked is yeah you know slightly higher yeah. double and double. every time yeah. it gets replaced with two right so it starts keeps increasing so purely by chance yeah. if i pick up one yeah and i do like 100 iterations yeah the entire urn will be red after some time or you know like a very though you know almost nothing will be yeah red and blue yeah so that shows how initial condition so it, yeah. it's like uh, like kerala for example yeah kerala for uh, historical reasons probably travancore probably other reasons whatever yeah they had higher literacy right they had uh, better sort of you know educational outcomes yeah and gulf happened yeah and there was instant in like historical terms like yeah, in a okay, few decades we won't die hungry we'll just go to gulf yeah, yeah. and everyone you know everyone mocks uh, you know uh, the gulf thing but yeah it really people went there earn money because yeah. they were clever they had education they had something they couldn't be absolute country bumpkins and do well in yeah. there yeah. are pakistani I, i went to you know the uae couple of times and i saw well, so i had a pakistani driver for one visit yeah and there are people sitting on the roads like you know in dressed in pathani yeah yeah so i asked my driver who these people were and yeah. uh, he said they were all pakistani laborers right who basically come yeah. like you know on some kind of fraud visa yeah and they're looking for daily labor yeah yeah so i said wow yeah but uh, you know it's only pakistan says yeah only pakistan is you'll never see indians like that <laughs> because they get great jobs yeah <laughs> no but actually yeah. like i think it's like probably one generation removed but the first uh, ones who went used to go in this like small boat it's called a patte mari mm. i'm referring to the name of the boat only because there's a movie called patte mari which mm. shows like their plight right? so they are basically illegal immigrants so mm. what happens the boat can take you only till like i don't know like severe distance away from the shore like 1 km or 2 km or whatever then you have to swim in the sea and not be caught by the guards there and somehow infiltrate into the land and find jobs so the first generation of these guys obviously like found some jobs and set it up so that the ones who followed could come in so yeah they had some kind yeah, of correct, correct, establishment yeah, yeah, correct yeah, establishment yeah. but like the initial condition and the indian situation i think is uh, brought to life by that one example of this uh, person who said all i need is on the chess board for one dry screen to yeah. be placed i think you you yeah, yeah. so better. yeah the legend is that yeah. the inventor of chess yeah the king said i'll you know whatever name your reward any yeah. amount so he says i want one grain on the first square, square. Yeah. two on the second four on the third and so yeah. on and king said this is trivial i mean i'll yeah. do it and he ran out of grain by the time he reached the 18th or 16th square or something yeah. like that yeah. then if he had gone to 2 power 64 yeah. there wouldn't have been enough atoms in the universe to <laughs> yeah probably cover that so yeah yeah, yeah. so that but uh, yeah i mean uh, just to remind listeners this is still an episode <laughs> on uh, fertilizer subsidies <laughs> i think that was a good place for a break yeah so let's go for a break and mm. come back and talk about what mm. narend really want to talk about yeah. Yeah. which is fertilizer subsidies <laughs> stay tuned yeah hey it's been another great week on the ivm podcasts network on the filter coffee podcast karthik talks to swetlana nodial programming director asia mubi about how movie curates access to world cinema introducing our new show cap gemini's techipedia series with sheila ditya m in the first episode we meet nishit shrivastav chief technology and innovation officer at cap gemini india he tells us all about the metaverse's impact on different domains on paisa vesa anupam explores stock market trends with prabhakar tiwari chief growth officer at angel 1 On all things policy, the Takshashila folk discuss how the latest events in Sri Lanka impact India. On the Habit Coach, Ashton shares three steps to shake off a slump. And on Say No to Drama, Chetna explains how we can protect ourselves from energy suckers. We've got some exciting news for you. IVM Podcasts has just launched its merch and our first line is out now. Head to the IVM Podcasts website and click on the shop tab. to check out our first collection of t-shirts 
Do follow us on social media via IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Don't forget to rate us on any platforms you're listening on. You can also check us out on YouTube. We are also doing a small listener survey to better understand how you respond to our shows and advertising on the network. We would really appreciate if you could spare a few minutes to fill it. It helps us build better shows for you. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance and Jupiter, a digital banking app. So welcome back uh, to Simplified with uh, Tony and Narin this episode and we are talking about a lot of things but actually Narin want to talk about fertilizers so yeah fertilizer yes. subsidies is what uh, uh, I was talking about and the problem actually is that uh, we have uh, basically three kinds of fertilizers one is uh, urea that is nitrogenous one is phosphatic that is phosphorus it there's a there's a fertilizer called diammonium phosphate right. and there is uh, potassium that is there is something called muriate of potash yeah so these are the three main things there are others there is calcium there's sulfur but they are not ne- required in nearly as great a quantity so it's nitrogen phosphorus and potassium which is yeah and, and the natural way to get this was like potassium i think was ash or something right? potassium is ash it is uh, ash from wood traditionally okay. yeah and uh, i don't know how it's made in the present day okay uh, whether it's mine i know that all these fertilizers require a hell of a lot of energy so you can synthesize them yeah out of uh, you know anything yeah except or they that, come out of a cow and yeah that kind of thing yeah. yeah and it needs to be synthesized using a lot of energy and catalysts right so energy rich countries such as russia and ukraine yeah uh they you know they have sources of gas gas is notoriously difficult to sell because you have to pipe it or right. you have to bottle it or do something like that but if you have any industry which needs a lot of energy you can directly use uh, the gas to provide that energy and make it the product of that industry is a lot easier to transport such as fertilizers right So Russia and Ukraine apparently produce a lot of our fertilizers and unfortunately for the world they are the guys who are really fighting yeah. hammer and tongs at each other yeah and uh, so potash prices and uh, especially phosphatic fertilizer DAP prices have gone through the roof yeah so now the government needs another extra 40 or 50000 crores yeah if it has to uh, if it has to provide subsidies if it has to keep the prices the same right and the problem but, with uh, so, yeah okay mm. yet another deviation i'm sorry yeah. but i'm sure like a lot of listeners of simplified know at least uh, one russian potash fertilizer producer and exporter mm. uh, which is called ural kali okay this is basically a sponsor of an f1 team which is going bankrupt uh, in the previous season and basically the owner or like one of the chief executives his name is some massipin is like i will sponsor the team as long as my son gets ah i know massipin yeah, yeah my son keeps telling me about yeah. i i think he uh, sort of means that uh, says that massipin is buying an f1 <laughs> yeah. team for his son yes. what are you bought to <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah so potash fertilizer can get you an f1 team as well that, yeah. that's how it's there so basically till the russia ukraine thing happened for one full season he was driving then obviously like they took off the sponsor and they had to find another one but yeah it's a lot of money in they yeah yeah it, right? and they are like they pops provide some 50% of the world's phosphatic fertilizer or something like wow. that wow okay. so now because of this war energy prices are impacted fertilizer prices are impacted at least four times that wow because uh, not only like rest of the world doesn't even have the manufacturing facilities because no one bothered to develop them you're getting fertilizer cheap from there right and uh, it's needed because if you don't put enough phosphatic fertilizers it will affect your crop and food prices will go through the roof which means people will still die of starvation not because despite they, yeah producing enough people will this, yeah. people will a lot of poor people will will suffer right, like right. so they what sri lanka did sri lanka had the same problem sri lanka had this problem in advance yeah. even before the war 
they uh, uh, you know so what they tried was they went and told everyone that let's go for organic this thing let's not buy fertilizers let's conserve our farm exchange right and what does what does organic farming mean so organic means you don't use chemical fertilizers okay so what, there is there the... is a sort of you know there is a debate about that okay people say that organic true organic farming because all natural fertilizers and chemical fertilizers synthesized fertilizers have the same active ingredients which is nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium or all three okay but to be truly organic yeah. all you need to do is not use pesticides so pesticides ah. are the harmful chemicals these are not is that's one point of view another point of view says and i think this is the licensing so if you are uh, if you need to if you want to get an organic license all you have to do is not use pesticides i think that's i think right. that how it works but a lot of purists feel and this is true uh, overuse of uh, nitrogen and overuse of uh, you know fertilizers in the soil yeah contaminates groundwater and leads to so there is one condition called blue baby syndrome which is apparently a killer oh okay. which is entirely it seeps due into to, the water system yeah basically. excessive nitrogen in the water right so it affects children so there are many such uh, you know and pesticides are but it worse. doesn't do anything to the crop per se so crop the plants take whatever they need right and the rest of it just leaches into the so crop. technically why should i as a consumer buy something organic as opposed to something yeah so if good. because the output is maybe a third if you don't use synthetic fertilizers right so it's just like crop will be three times more expensive it's so you will CSR. have to yeah it's csr okay and you know for people like you and me our uh, food uh, expenses are typically a very small fraction of your total expenses yeah but this may not be the case for uh, a minimum wage or something like that yeah no yeah. i'm i'm only asking because like uh, i think at some point for when we had a baby I mean, we still have a baby but like mm-hmm. she's older like anything the baby ate would be organic yeah. but like there's no real science in that right? i apparently not yeah. so a lot of people swear that there is really no benefit yeah. to be gotten from but it's great marketing to say right. that there is a benefit so yeah. people there are chains in the us yeah I think Whole Foods is one, yeah, which stock exclusively yeah. uh, these kind of. Uh, But it's more like the green washing thing that we spoke about on one of our episodes. Yeah, it's it's more a marketing ploy than really. Like, so I would think. Yeah. But you know, on the whole, it may because if I I read somewhere about the, so America is a big beef eating right. nation. Yeah. And it's brutal. Okay, the cattle industry there is horrible. Yeah. And the reason it eats america eats so much beef is the cat, the meat is really really cheap okay so back in the day like 70 80 years ago americans would eat beef once in a month or once in six months yeah. because it was expensive you had it only as a feast right the rest of the time you just ate vegetables like the rest of us yeah but then you know the corn revolution happened this thing everything and then they started mass producing cattle and then everyone has beef for breakfast lunch and dinner so they in order to now now it's a race so in order to sell uh, that much meat or grow that much meat they have to give it all kinds of antibiotics and steroids and mm. all kinds of food supplements yeah some of that which sort of seeps into yeah. humans as well so world famous reference to i think this is like probably the first or one of the first few episodes of the scene in the unseen where amit varma talks about how you know some change in medication or diet to cows led to like the parsi way of uh, yeah, yeah. death so being, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, final rights being changed yeah. completely so there is one ingredient one medicine yeah. called diclofenac sodium that is given to cows for some it's, it's an anti inflammatory it's given for to cows for some reason it's very cheap yeah and for some reason it is extremely toxic to vultures Yeah. So vultures will basically eat a cow, dead cow, which has been eating, which has been fed diclofenac. Yeah. And that vulture will basically die. Yeah. And uh, Parsis, just because they are uh, dead to the birds. Yeah. There are not enough birds to. Yeah. Eat them, and uh, so they had to stop that practice. Right. Yeah. So yeah, unintended consequences. So fertilizer subsidies do that. so they they lead to over so someone told me that uh, nitrogenous fertilizers urea is price controlled right 
Right. And urea is one fourth or one sixth or something the price of the other fertilizer. So though you need all the fert, like you know, you need urea that's nitrogenous. Urea is nitrogenous. Potassium. So the potassium, they can't afford to buy the potassium and the phosphorus one because okay. they're more expensive. Yeah. They they overuse urea to get crop yields. So they use as much as 10x or 20x or what is required. Just because it's cheap. Just because it's cheap and they have to, you know, they just, yeah. and every year they see a diminishing yield. So they just keep adding more, using more. Right. And the correct way to do this, all this apparently is to have soil testing. So if you, uh, you have to measure this, sort of inspect the soil, find out what is missing and use only that much. Yeah. But soil testing is an expensive uh, and sophisticated thing. You can't have it in every village. Right. And so this is what happens. Yeah. And fertilizer subsidy is direct to blame for that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that is basically the whole story of this simplified episode. <laughs> which, which we finally <laughs> yeah, which finally <laughs> That fertilizer subsidies are not, not great. Right. But there doesn't seem to be any way out because yeah. you stop the fertilizer subsidies, your agricultural production will go down, grains will be expensive and yeah. poor people won't have anything to eat anyway. So, yeah. I didn't let you complete the Sri Lanka story where they went organic. Yeah, so they went organic and they had a precipitous drop yeah. in their output. Yeah. And uh, I think they ended up having to import food in order to just survive. So, yeah. You know, it's uh, it, it really one hurt of the them. reasons for their yeah. economic collapse. Uh, one of the reasons. Also, they had two important crops. I think tea and rubber. I know what. Yeah. Which were cash crops. Yeah. That took a hit as well. Because of the decision to go completely organic. Yeah. Organic. yeah. So you need fertilizers, but not. I mean, it's again like a fine balance. Yeah. It? It's it's uh, very difficult. I mean. It's scary. It's one of those scary things. You, you don't, I mean, I as a city slicker yeah. never even knew that all this goes on under the hood. I don't even know there is a countryside. I I don't even know there are crops. I, I just sort of imagine rice growing quietly into <laughs> bags and coming to my house. Yeah. So there's an entire universe out there. Yeah. And uh, so I thought I would just, I was just brimming over with amazement. So I thought, yeah. you know, it might be some I'm sure many simplified listeners already, yeah. you know, know a lot more about it than I do. But yeah. on the out chance that someone doesn't, uh-huh. no, it's think. it's totally fascinating. I think like two things that uh, one of my Pepsi friends, uh, the famous friend from the mango shape shake incident, Prachi, once hmm. told me. Once is that I mean, uh, she's obviously not working for PepsiCo anymore, thank hmm. God. But like apparently, Lays. Um, tells farmers to cultivate a particular variety of potato for its chips. But you can't use that to grow anywhere else. So like they can literally sue you for growing that variety of potato if you're not selling it to PepsiCo or something like that. So yeah, yeah. so as like land holdings become divided and corporations become larger, there's obviously this like giant tension that plays out and obviously in in favor of the corn. Uh, corporations and like yeah yeah seeds are another thing so there was this uh, GMO seeds uh, thing yeah so cotton was uh, cotton is a big cash crop yeah you can't eat cotton so you uh, you know that's the difference between cash crops and uh, regular crops so if you grow your own rice or wheat a part of it you consume and part of it you sell yeah but if you're uh, so you know but but if you grow cotton you can't yeah and if your crop fails you literally you're bankrupt you have you have nothing you've taken all your money you spent it on seeds you spent it on fertilizer spent it on insecticides pesticides so cotton had one particularly uh, dangerous pest a lethal pest yeah which took a lot of uh, insecticide to kill yeah ball worm it was called right and these Monsanto developed a variety right. where it transplanted the gene from a bacillus yeah. into that and made it resistant to that ball worm. Wow. And uh, the Indian government banned it. Yeah. Because they said that uh, it was bad, it was genetically, it was you know, modified GM, this, that and the other. Yeah. And Gujarat farmers smuggled in some seeds, yeah. made sort of copies of that. Yeah. You know, sort of, and 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 they 
really did well in in cotton. Wow. Okay. And in Vidarbha, they had such disastrous like outcomes. There were a lot of uh, suicides in one particular year, if you remember. Right. Vidarbha yeah. farmers committed suicide <laughs> because they're completely devastated. They're yeah. completely bankrupt. No, I mean, the shameful thing here is that I know about this only because there was a Twitter hashtag called hashtag while farmers are dying yeah. in the Darba, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, it was used semi-jokularly in one context, yeah. obviously because you're not close to it, but I'm guessing the origins had like... Yeah. Real no, that was because well. people were making, uh, you know, they were sort of using that argument. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, Vidarbha right, right. farmers kind of thing. A lot of things happen Performative performatively. Yeah. yeah, without actually, so you have no intention of solving the problem, of doing anything to help anyone. Yeah, you just sort of you know make yourself look like a saint. Yeah, by repeating those Absolutely. tropes, that's that's what happened. Yeah. yeah, so we'll end on cotton, but before that, the other thing that I wanted to say was apparently, like I think in Haryana or somewhere, there was this a uh, new thing that came about, uh, which no one knew what it was. Till, I mean, basically it landed off on the supermarket shelves and it was called Jugni. Mm. Like Jugni, I think is Firefly. Is that correct? Jugni, Jugnu is Firefly. Jugnu is Firefly. Jugnu is Firefly. Okay. Jugni is uh, a woman. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Fine. Anyway, irrespective, it was called Jugni, but actually, you know what it was? It, it was basically zucchini, which is suddenly <laughs> like became a cash crop and, and was cultivated. But I think the greatest uh, sort of story to end agriculture and cotton like you mentioned and also podcasts mm. is this uh, tweet thread that uh, Latif Nasser from Radio Lab had posted mm. which is he claims uh, he says that this story was actually told to him by Robert Krulwich the like founder of uh, Radio Lab so good note to end basically if you look at the voting patterns of the US uh, the south is overwhelmingly red but there is a democratic swoosh uh, that comes across, right? So basically what happened was that there is a way in which uh, the ancient sort of continents and oceans came together and how this uh, swoosh has formed, right? Um, so basically there's actually two uh, whatever tectonic plates uh, colliding and forming that uh... Yeah, that area, something yeah. like that. But basically, what happened was that swoosh is the same as a black soil belt mm. that came across the southern states. And obviously, black soil meant you could grow cotton. cotton. Obviously, cotton meant you needed uh, slave labor, black slaves. Yeah. Mm. And obviously, slave labor meant a lot of people coming in at that point in time. And when like emancipation happened, uh, you know, their generations further came along, but it has led to like a democratic swoosh and this repeats over and over and again in elections yeah. so it's it's quite so you actually have geology sort of shaping how voting patterns happen pretty, in pretty much. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that that's a fa- there's a fascinating book actually yeah. called uh, origins or something written by this guy named lewis dartnell okay so it's all about this about plate tectonics and all so one fascinating thing he said is the continent of Africa is sort of plowing into Europe. Oh. And where the two meet, okay, yeah. the two plates actually, yeah. the African plate goes down yeah. and pushes the European plate up. Right. So European plate, which is basically Greece, yeah. that area, has hundreds of little islands. Yeah. And the African plate, because it's going down, right. is basically flat and featureless. Right. So you have far more human habitation on the jagged portion right. because you have vegetation you have shade you have waterways you have yeah. you know lagoons where fish breed everything yeah. on a flat and featureless plain you have mostly desert right so that's why europe like all civilization because of that little hmm. uh, niche of prosperity interesting started developing in greece yeah and just across the sea yeah. the continent of africa was pretty barren North just africa. nomadic yeah. tribes subsistence agriculture that Interesting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I think I think we've gone all around the yeah. world in this yeah. episode. My uh, sincerest apologies for not <laughs> leaving anyone any the wiser about fertilizer. There, was, there were subsidies. no subsidies on this podcast. Yeah. Like yeah. You had to like take the full thing <laughs> to get something out of it. Very organic. Yeah, very <laughs> organic. Yeah. yeah. So stay safe. Yeah. 
stay subs say subsidized <laughs> no, i don't know that is stay, right i don't know stay yeah. nitrogenous yeah stay, <laughs> stay nitrogenous and stay simplified and see you next week yeah. with yet another exciting episode on something that we'll yeah. think yeah. of <laughs> when, when when we get together yeah. next very very organically thank you that bye cheers. bye There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor Siddharth Deshmukh and I'm back with season 2 of my podcast to make you smarter. Smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10 minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid.